on a psalm, close your Bible, and go open. Just go back to Trinity chapter 1 and 5. So whenever you read Bible, if you anchor off psalms, just know if it's Proverbs, a little past the middle. If it's Job, it's a little to the left of the middle. Psalm 25. So we're going to sing this in a few minutes. So don't. So so try to resist the temptation to start singing it while we're while I'm reading it right now. So here we go. It's a little bit long. So I'm not going to I'm not going to read it one time through and then go back because it's a little bit too long to do that. I'm just going to go through it with you. And I'm going to start in verse. Number one. Thee, O Lord, lift up my soul. So right here we have a psalm of David, and David is in prayer. There are some psalms where he's not necessarily in prayer from the very beginning of the psalm. If you look at just a couple of psalms. After this, Psalm 27, you'll see he's not in prayer. And then if you look at verse 29, he's, uh, <clears throat> he's talking to the people here. And, uh, and he's so he, he, right here, Psalm 25, we're starting with talking with God. And here's the first thing he says. He says, <clears throat> I'm giving you, I'm lifting up. And he tells him what he's, he's giving him. He's not just giving him. I'm giving you. His soul is lifted up in the ways of God. At this moment, he cannot imagine not serving God. At this moment, he cannot understand why he ever sinned in the past, and he can't imagine why he would ever sin in the future. At this moment, you have a man who wants to praise God from a heart that is totally yearning to be right with God. So we've seen so many different kinds of psalms. We've seen a man who's in desperate need of help. We've seen someone who's angry, wanting, wanting uh, God to come and, 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 uh, and do judgment for him. But in this psalm, we have a man who is right with God, and he's now going to open his heart and just going to praise the Lord and describe what it's like to be right with God. In verse number two, it says, Oh my God, I trust in thee. And now he has this phrase, Let me not be ashamed. So, uh, Dave, you're, you're in, the, in the bank, in the credit union, I'm sorry, the credit union. You're in that environment, brother, and uh, you're trying to be a Christian. And you know what you want God to do? You want God, in the end, to not make you ashamed that you are the Christian by how things turn out where in the end, everybody else does well in life and you live a horrible life. Everything goes bad for you and, and you lose. That's what he's saying here. Wouldn't it be really sad if, if, if we went to battle and our forces come together and we, we pray, we get our lives right, we're all, bless God, and we go to war and we lose? Wouldn't that be awful? We'd be ashamed, right? We lost. That happened. There was a time when the children of Israel were going to fight against the, the Philistines, they brought the ark to everybody. And the ark showed up. You know what everybody did? They did not shrug their shoulders. They didn't say, oh. no. They shouted, yeah! To them, it was an awesome idea. Yeah, we've got Jehovah on our side. It was such a loud shout that the Philistines on the other side both heard it and figured out, oh, no, the ark is here. That same ark that divided the, 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 uh, the Jordan River when they walked into it. The same ark that walked around the walls of Jericho. There, it's here. Now, what ends up happening is that their leaders say, hey, guys, just play the man. Come on, get up. And they go fight against the Israelites with their ark and their God, and they whoop them. Pretty shameful. They take the ark. They keep the ark. So I guess, I guess we don't have the, the mighty one. Well, they put the ark in the house of Dagon, their god. And when they come in the next morning, he's flat on his face. His head is off and his arms are off. So, I mean, it's, we're talking, actually, it was the second day. The first day, he's just falling down. They put him back up. The next day, he's falling down again, and his head is off. And his, so our god is the real god. But they were ashamed. Now, if you understand the situation, Israel had, had uh, the, their, their religious leaders, namely Hophni, Phinehas, and their dad, Eli, had gone far away from God, and God was ready to judge them. And those two young men, those two priests, those men, Hophni and Phinehas, both died in that, in that situation. But the point is, is that we could be the ones, we're going to God saying, God, please 
please don't let us be the ones who cannot pay our rent. God, we're here at New Hope Baptist Church. Let us not be the ones that one day cannot have the electricity on. Let us not be the one that one day has to, to take down our website because we no longer have a church here. That would be shameful. Lord, let us not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. I can guarantee you there would be people, if we shut the church down right now, they'd be like, yeah, I knew it. Yeah, yeah, I knew it. And we don't want that to happen. That's what he's saying. Lord, please don't let it happen. Yea, let none, verse 3, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. That's what his prayer is. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they are ever of old. Now, at this moment in his life, he has, he's just longs to be closer to God, to know God at this instant. But at this instant, he has to know. He's not like he's just been this little goody two-shoes all his life. He knows that, in verse number, uh, verse number seven, he, he knows that he has things in his past. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in his judgments, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Now we're going to go into what happens to the person who decides, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to do your will. I don't want to mess around with sin. I want to be 100% given over to pleasing you. That's my whole heart. I just love you, Lord. What do you, what do you end up with? Now, he, before he gets there, he's going to say this. He's going to say, even right now, Lord, I have things in my life that I need you to, to pardon I need you to, to, Lord, the thing I did last week, Lord, the thing that I did last month, Lord, the thing that I've done recently, God, would you please pardon it? And if and he says, I want to be the one who keeps his covenant and his testimonies. Verse number 11, for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. What's the next four words? Verse 11, the last four of verse 11. What do you think that is? You know, he doesn't go into that. He doesn't tell us what his great thing is. Whatever it was, it was great. Do you know that you could have had great sin, I mean a big time mess up, just recently and be back here? Now, he's just mentioned the sins of his youth. Now he's saying this, the sins I have for thy name's sake, pardon mine iniquity. The, one, the stuff I have right now, the stuff that's still built up there, I've... I, I, I've Dealt with the stuff in the past. Lord, would you please not remember that anymore? But Lord, I also have iniquity right now. Lord, would you please pardon that iniquity? And I'll, t- I'll tell you, you could be right with God. Let me rephrase that. You could be not right with God when you walk in your, just a few minutes ago. You could leave here tonight. Everything changed. I have had services where when I walk out, I cannot believe that I could not have been right with him when I walked in. Why was... William Merrick was so nasty when he walked in this building. And now as I look and just, God, how do you even have mercy on me once again? I am just lifted up in the ways of God. And it doesn't have to be uh, this, this long, drawn-out process. It's you. You can get right with God as in like while you're listening to me right now. You can read the psalm yourself. You can just tune me out and just talk to God and be right with him. It's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And here's what you get. Verse number 12. For what man is... for I'm sorry, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. There's your first benefit of fearing the Lord. Now, we talk, the Bible talks about fearing the Lord so much. Most of us Christians don't have a real intense fear of God. We don't really have a sense of dread that God is watching what I'm doing. And if I do wrong, there's going to be recompense. A lost person is devoid of fear of God. That's why he's not coming to God. In fact, the very, very first step of someone coming to Christ is to realize there is a God and I'm not right with him. 
that I have sinned and that he has watched and there is judgment coming. The Bible says that he sent the Holy Spirit to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That's what he does when he comes and dings our heart, says, judgment is coming, pal. And if I ever recognize that and realize, oh, no, then it changes things. I can, I can just tell you, my teacher in high school, he wore this thing of keys on his, on his belt the entire time. And he would step out for a few minutes and you could listen to the keys go away. By the time they heard earshot, we were already talking, you know, it starts real quiet, you know, it's just the first person says something and the next person responds and then there's a snicker and then somebody else says something and then there's, there's absolute laughter. But when the sound of those keys came back to our ears, instant silence because he had the ability to inflict punishment on us that he was willing to employ. And we had a certain reverence and fear of our teacher. And when we did not believe that he could know what we were doing, we didn't mind doing things that if he were present, we would not dare do. So what would happen if he never left our classroom? We would stay employed incessantly in our school, or at least pretending to be. Right? So what happens if I believe that God Almighty hates sin and is a God of justice and therefore judgment? What if I believed that, that I would fear him? And what would happen if I feared him? Here's what would happen. Here's what happened. Number one, verse 12. He, him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And I'll tell you what happens to any person who begins to fear God. He gets smarter in actual wisdom. I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm, I can tell you right that the young person who just a couple years before uh, had, a, had a bad spirit and agitated, and was just kind of just doing dumb stuff, just, just getting right with God, it doesn't take very long before they just have a certain sense of wisdom about them that makes them, people want to be around them. Number two, look at verse number 13. His soul shall dwell at what? Isn't that interesting? When you fear God, your soul can dwell at ease. You know, it's amazing when you, you have to get things done because the person that you fear retribution from is there, and so you'd get it all done, and then it's finished. And that thing is no longer weighing on you, whatever that would be. It's just something about doing everything you're supposed to do that makes you go, ah, and you end up being at ease. That's number two. Number three, verse number uh, 13. And his seed shall inherit the earth. What does his seed mean? It means his kids and his kids' kids and his kids' kids. They're going to inherit the earth. Wow. You, you, I'll tell you. If you go back and look at the guy, Jonathan Edwards, who preached one sermon in the 1600s called this. In, the, in New England, he preached a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He preached that sermon. That was the title. Isn't that an amazing title? It was, he described us as sinners hanging by a spider web's thread over hell. And while he was preaching that, you know how his style was? What I've heard, I, I, I've read this, that he read that. It was, it was a, a, a Puritan preacher. He was not super dynamic. He didn't run on the platform. He didn't yell. He didn't do that stuff. He simply read it from his notes, just read verbatim. He had it all written out. Before he was done, there were people holding on to the pillars that supported the roof of that church for fear that they would fall into hell that instant. And it began what was now called the Great Awakening. From that sermon began to spread, and the Great Awakening transformed this nascent country. But if you look at it, there's, a, there's interesting research been done on his family. And as you look at what happened to the Edwards family in subsequent generations, there is a long list of eminent individuals. Of course, there were pastors, there were college presidents, there were judges. Eventually, there were, there, uh, uh, there were major leaders as America actually became a nation that were direct descendants from Jonathan Edwards. You'll see that happen over and over again, where those who fear God, their children seem to do well. 
then those children, of course, oftentimes leave those roots and then their family, with their offspring, go in a, in a worse direction. But there is a blessing that God somehow put, the way he's crafted the universe to run, there is a blessing that passes from someone who fears him to their next generation. It's just awesome. And you can have that. Can just keep going. Verse 14. Here's the next one. Ready? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. We all, we all like secrets, right? You and me were talking recently about that. The thing that makes life worth living is mystery. I'm, I'm real big on this. I think it's, you know why? Because it's a secret I figured out. <laughs> you, you know what you love about everything in your life? If you love it, it's because there's something you haven't figured out yet. There's secrets you're, you're unlocking about something. That's why you want to travel. That's why you bought the new book and read it. That's why, if you got into a book recently, that's why you did it. You know why you want to play that video game? Because there's things you haven't figured out yet. There's whole corners of the world you haven't figured out yet. You know why you switch games? Because you've kind of conquered the game. You, you know it. You know all the secret moves. You've got it down. You want a new thing to conquer, right? Am I right? So life is, what makes life so wonderful is finding out little secrets. Do you know there's a reason why God has never allowed a human being to come in full visual contact with who he is. And the reason is, it's because he wants to leave evermore for you and me to explore. There's, you'll never come to the end of you figured out God because he's too deep, he's too mysterious, he's too great, and he made it that way on purpose to make your life seeking him an endless, wonderful journey of uncovering new facets and ideas and deepness to who God is. And that's awesome. Well, who gets to know that? You will have people, I know them, who will go to university and study religion, religious philosophy, comparative religions, and they have no faith. They don't believe in it, but they think it's interesting to learn about religions and stuff like that. Do you know what makes interesting? You can do Christianity without the Holy Spirit of God. It's very straightforward. But you have someone who the Holy Spirit begins to reveal God to? There is endless secrets that you have the door open to, that little window that you get to see in. And you know what's awesome is that the people around you are totally oblivious of it, and you are the keeper of this amazing secret that if you want to, you can meet someone else into it and say, this is so awesome. Okay, who gets that? I'll tell you who it's not. It's not the person who goes to the class. It's not the person who buys the book necessarily. It's not even the person who reads their Bible every day and can answer every Bible question. It's the one who fears God. That's who gets to understand these secrets. Ah, it's so awesome. Verse 14, the secret Lord is with them that, that, that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Here, look it. Here it is. You get to see it. Nobody else gets to see it. You want to see it? Here, tonight, there's my covenant. Like, oh, I get it. That's so cool. It's awesome. Verse number 15. David says this, mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of distress. If you talk to any, any, any godly Christian, it doesn't matter what phase they are in life, no matter how madly they are in love with Jesus Christ, if they are serving God, they will at the same moment have troubles, have affliction, feel, the word desolate means there's, when, when, imagine what desolation means. When, when, when there's been a war and there's just desolation left, or there used to be a city. If you go to Ukraine right now, you'll see just cities left desolate. 
if you go back and look at pictures of World War I in the, in the uh, eastern France there, where, there, where the Germans built their trenches and the, and the French and the British built their trenches, and they just shelled each other for, for four years. And by the time it was done, it was just desolation. There were no trees, just a few stumps. It was just mud. There was no grass. There were no buildings left. There was nothing except mud for a, one end of France to the very bottom. You can go look at pictures. It's, it's unbelievable to imagine that today it's full of trees. It is. There was just desolation. You know what he said? He said, I feel desolate. There are times I feel desolate. For I am desolate and afflicted. And here's what you're going to discover. You're going to discover that God will, will allow you to go through times where you feel very lonely. Where it's like the, the beautiful field of friends is just, there's, there's none. They've all been cut down. There's, there's, they all left me. But what ends up happening is that you get close to God. And if you reread this again, you'll see where this man, you're not looking at a man who's saying, I hate life. You're looking at a man who needs God. And what God does to me is that he pulls out those things that, that, that hold up my life, the pillars. And it could happen to you one day that the amazing stable father and the godly mother that you have simply aren't there. Something happens. The Lord takes them away early. You're, you're no longer living with them, whatever it is. That church that stood there that was holding you up is now gone. And suddenly, whatever other pillars were there, and you're there about to fall. And all you have left is God. And you know what he said? That's, that's good enough for me. So he, he said, bring me out of this. Verse number 18. Look upon mine affliction and my pain. And forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies, for they are many. They hate me with cruel hatred. Oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. So what is he going to rely on? He's going to rely on integrity and on brightness. The next verse says that. Uh, I've told, uh, in, in, in Sunday I've told the story of, about the, the, the man I met um, recently. I, if you ask me at church, I'll show you this picture. I showed a couple of you guys. Recently, Brother Nathan Ching sent me a picture of this guy because he was here that night. There was that guy named Tian Xiaojun, this little mousy guy I told you about. You can see his picture if you want to. He sent it, <laughs> sent it to me. And uh, he was the guy who, when he finished college, he and his friends decided they were going to they were going to do their business. They're going to have a computer business uh, selling software and stuff, and they weren't going to sell pirated software. They were going to do it without any kind of uh, uh, fubai, no corruption, nothing, nothing like that. So that was their plan. Everybody told them, you, you won't be able to succeed. Even the professor that led him to Christ, that brought him to Christ in the first place, told him, you're going to have to start by selling the pirated stuff. Then you can eventually, hopefully, you can transition over to where it's just all above board. No, we're not going to do that. So they just started the business in uprightness and integrity, and they failed. The good, the bright spot of this, the bright, the bright spot in this story is that this brother decided the reason why he failed was not God, and it was not because he did it uprightly with integrity. No, he decided it's because he didn't know enough about how to run a business the Bible way, God's way. And I told you about the fact that he then made a commitment, a very foolish commitment at church in front of other witnesses, said, I'm going to read my Bible through a hundred times the next year. Another brother said he'd do it with him. When he told me that, I was incredulous. I did not believe that he had done it. I made sure I said, did you, you, you did? Yeah. Oh, me. In 365 days, year? Yeah. My mind did a quick calculation. I said, you mean you read it through like every three to four days? Yeah. How is this possible? And he explained to me that they literally all day long, all they did was sit with their Bibles open and have a tape recorder that could play their tapes faster. And so imagine that high-pitched, you know, um, you know, trust the Lord with all the heart of the Lord, and just going all the way through. And he did it a hundred times. And I said, so what happened at the end? Did, how'd your business go? He said, by the time I was done, I had no interest in business. And the Lord just blessed him. And he was, and, and if you know the story, it's awesome how God just preserved him. But it was integrity 
and uprightness of heart. And he said, you know, Lord, it would be terrible if, if, I, if, I, if, I, would, if I did the, integrity, the, the way with integrity and uprightness of heart and then I failed. It'd be so bad, Lord. Would you please preserve me? So here we are. We are, uh, young people, you're, hopefully you understand a little bit, but your parents are going to be going through the next few months, next maybe a couple of years, I don't know, where things are going to be hard. You're going to have a hard time. Your parents, your dads, those of you who have businesses, I think about your, I was talking about your dad just a few hours ago with another brother. Uh, your dad works so hard. He's got his little business and it's just it's so awesome. But you know, as people don't have as much to spend and it, borrowing money becomes a harder, now they're going to have to be able to, to, to hire somebody to come in and do some work on, or on their property. So what's going to happen? Oh no! You know, it would be, it'd be terrible if we were the ones who went bankrupt, right? The guys who did tithe, the guys who helped people, the guys who just paid their bills, the guys who, who, who weren't trying to trick people. Wouldn't it be terrible? And you know what he said? You know, Lord, it'd really be sad. Please don't let us be ashamed. Please, please. That's what he does here. Let's finish this up here. Verse number 20, 22. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. In the end, what he finishes with is this. God, would you please bless the group that I'm with as well? And let me say, when you go to the Lord... When this kind of spirit, there's going to be something about you that says, not just, oh, bless me, bless me, I want to do it. It's something about it that says, I yearn to see my church do well. Lord, bless this group of mine that I get to be part of. So tonight we're going to be going to, to prayer. Uh, there's some prayer sheets in the back. If you, if you look at them, uh, if, you, if you would like one, they're back there. Uh, there's a few things on there to, to pray for. Uh, the, the new one on there is um, pray for um, uh, Sammy. Not this Sunday, but the following Sunday is planning on getting baptized. That's awesome. And then there's been, um, just pray for, pray for a guy, a, a, a brother named Cristiano and Leo. You'll see Cristiano come in pretty often. Leo has to work on Sundays. But he's about, he's already given his, 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 uh, his, his month notice. So uh, Lord willing, and they're the ones who are planning to move back to Marin, which is like, ugh. Um, but he said they'll still come out here. We'll see. Amen. Pray that that happen. Amen. It's a long drive from uh, from uh, down there. But there, they've been. I've been studying with them since uh, since Danny knocked on their door. And uh, Danny, thank you for knocking on their door. <laughs> and uh, I still want to thank you one time when I go just down to study. I mean, I mean, brother, we were taught literally today two solid hours just talking about baptism in the Bible. It was awesome. It's like the third time we talked about baptism in a year. But, uh, I mean, we get deep in the scriptures, all sorts. And just to watch them grow, it's just been awesome. And so, um, so they, they, they are looking forward to get baptized. And today we put two and two together and realized, hey, you're finishing your work. You can come on Sundays right at the week, two weeks before Easter. That will mark the one-year anniversary of you coming to New Hope Baptist Church after that guy knocked on your door. And guess what? They might get baptized on that day. Would you pray about that? So it's Cristiano and Leo. It's on the, on the, on the prayer list. If you, if you get one of the prayer lists there, you'll see that there. All righty. So we're going we're gonna to break up. Um, gentlemen, all the men, we're going to be over here together. Ladies, I'm going to send you over there. And uh, let me see here. Uh, brother, would you and Marco, would you want to and take those two chairs and just flip that? Just, he'll, he'll show you what to do. Just flip the chairs around for the ladies. We're practicing the third row there. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to bring this around and just going to be in a semicircle right here. Uh, we'll try to, uh, yeah, brother, take those chairs and move it right in here. All righty.